Welcome to Nerd Alert! Today we have a show with one of my favorite guests, my friend, but also my very talented friend, Ivan Van Norman. Hi. Hello, buddy. <laughs> Ivan is, of course, from TBS's King of the Nerds first season. He's also the creator of Outbreak Undead, and now he's the new cr the creator of the new game, Outbreak Deep Space, which is now on Kickstarter. Right, yeah. Tell us about it. Uh, it's a, we were well known for Outbreak Undead, which was a zombie survival role-playing game. Uh, now we're making a new game called Outbreak Deep Space, which is kind of the sci-fi survival horror version of that same type of creed. Allows you to accurately simulate all the wonderful tropes that we're familiar with and hopefully do them in a terrifying and not so engaging way uh, as far as who lives or dies. It's very Cthulhu in nature. It's not about, you know, how long you'll live. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, about you when. Die? You will die. Oh. It just It just is a matter of how and what you do in the meantime. <laughs> kind of nihilistic. <laughs> <laughs> so well, we, we all die, Kim. We, we all, all die. Do. I meant soon. <laughs> soon and in the middle of <laughs> deep space. That's kind of the, the element. So this is so. another book and dice game in the vein of Outbreak Undead. Right. But with different art styles. Yeah, I mean, because uh, Outbreak Undead was a modern system, mm -hmm. and it kind of did all the zombie trope stuff. Um, you know, you go out, you uh, you have a zombie um, outbreak, and you kind of are going through the urban environment. And we did some expansions, like we did some forestry mm -hmm. stuff and some, some zombie animal expansions. But this one is much more akin to, like, what happens when you're exploring other planets or you find some trans-dimensional rift in the middle of a spaceship? How do you and your ragtag team of engineers and specialists <laughs> deal with the I horror like that's it. waiting inside, you know? So. Sci-fi is more my, what, is, what I love more than, it, yeah? well, I like, I like zombies too. I would right. say sword and sorcery is the lowest. But. So that's fair. I mean, and, the, and that's kind of the uh, key thing is like, uh, people have tried to take Outbreak Undead and expand it to do things like the flood mm -hmm. and do things like um, dead space. But now we're like, okay, well, let's do that and let's add a modular tech system so they can do like power weapons and let's make it so that, you know, the difference between time on a ship and time versus a planet can be radically different, you know, so, because obviously we Ooh. don't live all on Earth time. I didn't consider that. Know? Yeah. So it's like, how do you deal with, a, with an outpost that, you know, it has literally sun for 64 hours in a day, and how does that go into your stronghold and resource system? So, you know? That all sounds very thorough. So it's, we, that's kind of our thing, is we like to do detail, we like to be thorough, we like to put research into what it would be like to truly deal with the unknown. So, yeah, yeah, check it out. It's fun. It's on Kickstarter right check now. Check it out on Kickstarter. We'll put the link below <laughs> it's in the, the description. Yes. Yes. Um, now, how many millions of dollars are you looking for for this? Millions of dollars. <laughs> no, no, we're only looking for eight grand to okay. do the first print run. Completely reasonable. Yeah, and actually the game is 98% is done in development, and it's 80% laid out in the book. Like, so, it, we're pretty much done. We just wanted to, it's funny, because a lot of these game companies nowadays are using Kickstarter more as a pre-order system. Mm. And we'll kind of get into that in our, in our story here soon. But yeah. the, I, the <laughs> idea is, is that most games or companies are most successful when the game's already done, and they just get it into a pre-order system, and all they need is the capital to kind of find out, okay, well, do we need to print 5,000 books or 250 books, Ooh. you know? Because it can mean a huge difference as far as money and capital goes, you know? And if you're ordering 10,000 books, then awesome. Then you have more to work with and you realize that you can usually get your uh, consumers a better price, you know? Because the more you print, the more, the more that per unit it goes down, at least as far as book publishing goes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad that you put those caveats in to <laughs> protect the donators and yourself, because that takes us to our first story today. Yep. Uh, Washington has filed their first consumer protection lawsuit against crowdfunding projects that do not deliver. Yeah. So certain Kickstarters who promise certain perks to their, their donators in the campaign and do not deliver, beware, because now you have laws against right. that. And I remember the first major Kickstarter faux pas, and it was a video game, they raised something like a million, a million and a half dollars. It was one of the first like big campaigns that really made a lot of money, and, they, and that wasn't that they didn't necessarily deliver on it, but that they literally burned through all that money 
Was that the case where the guy had given himself an advance to cover some things because they thought more capital was coming? Right. And it never showed up never and showed then up. belly up. And it just the company just literally flopped, you know? And so there's a difference, I feel like, from a company bellying up because of either, you know, bad business choices or, or investment or whatever, because that happens in the investment world all the time. Mm -hmm. And then flat out just being like, thanks guys, and then Bye. going off to Mexico or whatever. You well, know? this specific lawsuit is against Ed Nash and uh, his October 2012 Kickstarter for the playing card game, Asylum. Yeah. So after a year, none of the donators had received any perks they were right. promised. Um, it seemed like the game was in no state of being completed and that they were never going to get their promised goods, their investment back. Right. Uh, that the, the owner or the, yes, the president of the company, uh, Altius Ed Nash, had fled. Right. Et cetera. And, and, and they needed to put these consumer protections in place because that's a big danger on, on Kickstarter. And, and they've only been dealing with it up to this point by saying that Kickstarter is a place in which people invest into an idea. It's not theoretically an investment. They're not, they're not, um, well, they're not investors, they're just pledging their support to a product or an idea. Mm -hmm. And the big thing in that is, is that while they theoretically don't have any legal ownership of the company and they're just doing this from, quote unquote, the you know, graciousness of their heart, is that they still are giving physical product as a result of their contributions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I feel like, you know, the consumers are entitled to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And of but. course, you know, Kickstarter doesn't have the muscle, nor do they think they need it, to enforce any of these things. So now it's up, I guess, to the, the state to enforce these things. So, like, the, the a district attorney in Washington, Washington, right, is so the, the one who's stepping attorney. forward, right. who's saying, "Hey, you know, I'm going to represent my constituents, and we're going to get their money back, and then some." Do you think it was a backer? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Because it did actually say, I think, in the article that it was like there was at least 12 of them oh, of I the 860. Was, uh, Attorney General Bob Ferguson a backer. I, w I would, maybe I, he's no, a backer. I think Who he's knows? He's out for his constituents, <laughs> which is great. He so wants his card game. He wants, he doesn't, he knows that, you know, if there's an intent to defraud or if they are defrauded, that they deserve retribution. So right. if you do this now, the government can come after you. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. <laughs> is this going to set any kind of precedent? in oh, the future yeah. for Kickstarter. Like, is this nonsense done now that someone stepped forward and started a lawsuit? Oh, Tim, nonsense is never done. <laughs> I think it, it, it's been, at this point, it's kind of been a case-by-case -case basis, you know? But I, I wouldn't be surprised if now it kind of became the standard in which people who are donating to Kickstarter now have to, 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 to look to, they at least have the safety net of knowing that if it's a really bad situation, not like that the backer, or that the creators of the company are lazy or they're just not, you know, fulfilling everything in the timeliness that they want, mm -hmm. but if like they just flat out ditch, then it's almost like insurance, you know, it's like... Well, Kickstarter and crowdfunding in many ways are, are kind of a new frontier. Right. And there, there aren't rules or laws governing it yet until now, so I'm glad that this is in place. Um, they actually, Kickstarter made a statement that said, tens of thousands of incredible projects have been brought to life through Kickstarter. We want every backer to have an amazing experience and we're frustrated when they don't. Right. We hope this process brings resolution and clarity to the backers of this project. Uh, have you ever been burned? Uh, no. So far I've had a very uh, you know, positive experience with crowdfunding. Right. You fund big projects though. For the most part, yeah. Yeah, you it, fund things that if it weren't funded, they would be yeah, If it weren't for me, stink. it's still gonna happen. Yeah. yeah. That's actually kind of one of the weird and interesting things about the culture of crowd for, uh, crowdfunding quite mm -hmm. a bit, is that if you think about it on a press day, like say for example you launch your campaign on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I'm turning this into crowdsourcing advice. Sorry guys. Um, if you launch your campaign on a Saturday and you raise 5% all right, of your initial funding, now, if you were to read an article about a project, or if you're just going to go and browse through your on your computer and you saw a project that was five percent funded, what would be your first reaction? No. No. Doesn't no. look good. Doesn't, Doesn't look, look good. promising, <laughs> right? Even though there's more than ninety-five percent of the time left, right? There's no way that the momentum is your brain pick up from that. Your brain has already said failure. Interesting. Now what happens is We're after that people. first day, so. <laughs> but if on that first day you saw 30% completed and there was still, you know, like 26, 28 days left, then what would your brain Solid say? Solid maybe. People are racing for perks at that point. Like, the <laughs> okay. perk I want might run out. Right. This is an opportunity and if I don't jump on it because this thing's leading on a projected course, I'm going to miss out. 
And if you saw something that said 50% on its first day, then you're even more like, oh crap, you know? I'm not gonna get the lithograph I want, no. shit! Right, My, those limited ones are gone. That's so. a very interesting uh, psychology almost, or, or case study of how Kickstarter works and how funders' minds work. What do you think of Kickstarter and their uh, inability to deliver sometimes, sometimes on their uh, promised perks? Do you think there should be federal laws in place to promise that the funders do get what they, do, uh, what they were promised? Please let us know what you think below in the comments and please subscribe.